This is Rachel, and today in our supervision curriculum, we are going to cover topic 11, which is on teaching strategies, task analysis, and token systems. So let's start by talking about trial and error versus errorless learning. So errorless learning is a procedure that is used to prompt correct behavior and responses so that the individual does not have the opportunity to make a mistake. Errorless learning creates a more positive learning environment and makes learning easier for many individuals. There's more prompting um, and we are reinforcing more frequently. The learner is less likely to um, experience uh, frustration from not getting the correct answer. Trial and error learning involves presenting the SDs and only prompting when the individual fails to respond correctly. So for example, clap your hands and instead they touch their head and we'd say, that's not it. Um, clap your hands, they again touch their head and we say, no, that's not right. Clap your hands, then we prompt it and we reinforce and then clap your hands and they clap their hands. Errorless learning, by contrast, is using those prompts to begin with and fading that support out so that the learner is not making a mistake. So clap your hands and we prompt it, clap your hands, we prompt it, clap your hands, we prompt it, and eventually we fade out, clap your hands, and they do it independently. Reasons why you might use uh, trial and error learning. So well, errorless learning is likely to be um, more uh, preferable for the learner. Um, most learners are going to uh, respond well to getting the support that they need and gradually fading that support out. Um, and this is a great way to teach new skills. Um, trial and error learning might be used when um, we are working on some uh, discrimination. So we've learned this skill and we've learned this skill and now we're trying to run um, them in discrimination. So we might um, be giving a uh, we might not be prompting initially, and then instead only prompt if they have um, missed that. So this would be used for like maintenance skills, mastered skills that the learner has already demonstrated, but then maybe they don't perform under a certain condition. So then that's when we would um, jump in and provide the prompts after they have made an error. But generally speaking, errorless learning is the best choice for uh, teaching new skills because it makes the learning process smoother with less frustration and less likely to evoke uh, challenging behaviors or overly adapted behaviors by not getting the correct answer. Um, mass trials versus interspersed trials. So these are also terms that we would encounter within our teaching strategies. Um, mass trials are used most often when introducing a new skill and you're going to work on the same skill for several trials in a row. So in this case, we're working on clap hands over and over again. We also might mass trial a general skill, for example, motor imitation, and we do all of our motor imitation back to back. Um, again, mass trials are very good for when you are teaching a new skill because it provides a lot of opportunities in a row, which creates a good opportunity to fade out any prompts that you might be using. Um, and there are certain situations where mass trials are how it is presented in the natural environment. So for example, if the learner is in school and they have this reading block, this is an hour for reading, this is an hour for math, this is an hour for social studies. Um, these are times when the natural environment is mass trialing certain skills or certain subjects. However, outside of those particular opportunities, what we'll probably see is that the learner um, is experiencing or that in our natural environments, we are um, interspersing our skills. So we are working on different skills sort of mixed in together. 
Um, this is again, another one that's good for when you're doing discrimination. Um, you want them to clap their hands, but not just when we are practicing following instructions or motor imitation. Um, you also want them to be able to do that if it comes up later or colors. We want them to recognize their colors, but not just when the color flashcards are out. We want them to recognize the colors at lunch and at recess and when they're playing with their toys at centers or whatever, right? So we might specifically um, intersperse certain, certain skills um, within mastered skills so that we are basically like maintaining that skill across different topics almost, right? So um, we might mix some things together. Again, this is generally used after they've initially mastered the skill and when we're working on discrimination or maintenance and we're practicing these skills generalization in other settings. So clap your hands. What's this? Um, point to your hat. Clap your hands. Count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Great, clap your hands. And so we're flipping back and forth between other skills and the skill that we are trying to intersperse. So, um, mass trials are generally used for teaching new skills. Interspersed trials are generally used when it's mastered and you are fading it into the natural environment or generalizing it into the natural environment. Um, Errorless teaching is generally used for new skills. Trial and error teaching might be used um, if the learner has already mastered the skill and they are generalizing it to new environments. Task analysis. So many skills are too complex to be viewed as a single response. For example, some of our self-help skills like brushing your teeth, washing your hands, making a sandwich, they require a sequence of behaviors, not a simple one-step instruction um, like clap your hands or touch your head, although we might give the instruction, the cue might still be go brush your teeth, make a sandwich, wash your hands. Um, there are multiple steps. When we are teaching a complex skill that has multiple steps, we might use, um, probably will use a task analysis. And the task analysis is going to identify each single step of the more complex skill. Um, so for example, a task analysis of washing hands might look like this. Turn on the cold water, um, put your hands under the water for a second, pick up the soap. Um, this one specifies which hand to use because maybe for this learner that matters. Maybe for other learners it doesn't. Uh, rub the soap between your hands for three to five seconds. Put the soap back on the dish with the, um, rub the palms together, rub the back of the right hand, rub the back of the left hand, rinse under the water, pick up the towel, wipe the right hand dry, wipe the left hand dry, put the towel back. So that is an example. Um, task analysis, like everything else, is not a one size fits all. So just because I have this task analysis here for washing hands, that doesn't mean that every learner I'm going to use the same task analysis for. Um, for example, this learner, we've specified right hand or left hand, um, but uh, for other learners, it may not matter. Um, when you're doing things like tying shoes, um, you need to factor in what is the dominant hand of the learner. Um, and, uh, and, and our goal is not to change the dominant hand of the learner. Our goal is to just help them learn to be more independent with a sequence. Um, task analysis is basically um, like a recipe. We use these all the time, right? Um, there are some recipes that sure, I can make without um, looking at the card, um, but there are others that I need to look at the card and know all the little bitty steps, right? Because I, I need that as a prompt. I need the recipe written down as the prompt of how to do this. Um, the task analysis itself does not have to be a checklist of skills for the learner. That is more self-monitoring um, and can be used for learners where having the pictures or the written steps is very helpful and can help them be more independent. So it could be a visual prompt 
for teaching the skill, but it doesn't have to be. Um, a learner, the, the task analysis could just be a cue for the person teaching and taking data um, to know which steps and how to help the individual at each step. The learner doesn't necessarily have to see these steps written out or mark them off or anything like that. So although they sometimes go together, they don't have to. Having a visual list of the steps is a visual prompt having the steps broken down is the task analysis and steps can be broken down in a task analysis without our learner necessarily needing or using a visual prompt that goes back to our prompt and prompt fading um, what is the appropriate prompt for this learner for this skill there are three primary strategies for teaching skills in a task analysis and which strategy you pick is going to depend upon the skill as well as how the individual learns. So um, let's picture our um, hypothetical task analysis is steps one through 10. Forward chaining um, is going to be where I begin to fade out my prompts on step one, but I continue to prompt through all of the rest. So when you're teaching, um, again, think back to our prompt and prompt fading. When we're teaching a new skill, we're going to pair the um, what we want to become the SD with the prompt that currently controls the behavior. So in a task analysis, the SD, the initial SD is going to be that instruction or cue that's going to start the chain. And then for each step, the SD is the step before it and the reinforcer is the step after it until you make this chain and you get to the terminal reinforcer, the end reinforcer. So with forward chaining, we are going to start by fading our prompts on step one. So we're gonna prompt through everything and we're gonna start fading our prompts on step one. When we can successfully fade our prompt out, completely on step one, and our learner is independent with performing step one, then we're going to start fading step two. And we're going to continue to fade, or we're going to continue to prompt all the rest of the steps. Then they do one and two independently, and we prompt three through 10. Then they do one, two, three, and we prompt four through 10, et cetera, et cetera. Every time we practice the task analysis, we help the learner complete the entire sequence. So you don't just go to a certain step and stop, you go through the whole thing. And the best way to remember this or to think about it so you don't forget that piece is think about it like a recipe. I can't take a break in the middle of making a cake or the cake's not gonna come out right. I need to continue to have the um to complete the whole step some of it will be with help and some of it will be without help but i'm going to have to um complete the whole routine every time otherwise i don't end up with a cake i don't end up with whatever it is that i'm making and i can't start in the middle because how did all those other things get there right so Anytime you're working with a task analysis, you're always going to do all of the steps. What changes is which ones you're prompting and which ones the learner is doing independently or you're working on fading out your prompts. So forward chaining, you're gonna start fading from step one, but then you're gonna prompt the rest. And then when they're independent, then you're going to let them be independent. And then step two, start fading, et cetera, et cetera. Backward chaining, is the reverse. You are going to prompt them through everything. And then on the last step, you are going to start fading out your prompts. So prompt, prompt, prompt. We get to step number 10. I start fading my prompt. When they can do step number 10 independently, as we go through this, now I'm going to prompt all the way. And then step nine, I'm going to start fading my prompt. And step 10, they're going to do independent. And then I'm going to do all the way through. And I'm going to uh, start fading my prompt on eight they're going to do nine and 10 independent. And we're going to go through that until they can do the whole sequence independently. 
total task presentation um, is going to be where you are fading each step as the learner needs it. So instead of only fading in a certain order, if my learner can do steps five and six um, independently, then they can do five and six independently. So I might start with some help on one, two, three, four. They do five and six on their own. Seven, I'm fading out. Eight, nine, and 10, they still need a lot of support with. But each step is faded on its own. So it allows for a learner who might have pieces and you're just working on putting it together. The learner doesn't have to wait for you to get to that step to fade out. You can start fading out those steps where they don't need the help with that part. So you're sort of jumping in and jumping back out as they are demonstrating um, which steps they can perform independently. So um, you might choose forward chaining if the learner already maybe has um, uh, has demonstrated some skill set towards responding to that initial cue. So if I say go wash your hands and my learner knows to go to the bathroom, maybe I want to use forward chaining, right? But I know that it's going to take me a while to go through. And, and I think that that works well for this particular learner to work on one skill at a time. Backward chaining, you might use when the end result is already in and of itself a powerful reinforcer. So cooking or making coffee or whatever it is that, um, that the end result is going outside, um, then maybe putting on my shoes, the end result is the natural consequence of going outside or getting to eat the food that I just made. Then that might make sense to start with backward chaining because then that independent skill, as you start to fade out step 10, uh, that independent skill is reinforced by the natural consequences of whatever the end result is. Total task presentation is good for learners that don't need to go one step at a time. Um, learners that may already have demonstrated that they can perform certain aspects of the uh, task analysis, but they might just not know to do it in sequence or be able to complete the whole routine. Those are situations where you're going to want to use total task presentation. All right, so now let's talk about token economies. Um, so token systems or token economies are when we're using generalized condition reinforcers to trade in for other reinforcers. Could be points, tokens, stickers, check marks, tally marks, other items, markings. Money is, in our natural environment, an example of a token economy. Money, the paper and the metal, is not valuable by itself, but we can trade it in for things that are valuable. And now, I don't know about y'all, but I never even see most of my money. It goes direct deposit into my bank account where it's just numbers, and then I pay bills from my bank account. I don't even write checks, and it goes right out. And so all it is is like digital numbers representing supposedly whatever I have. Um, credit cards, things like that, right? Those are, it, it's a money is a token economy, a token system. The money itself is not valuable. It's valuable because we can buy other things with it. Um, token systems work the same way. The tokens or the marks or the stars or the stickers are not reinforcers in and of themselves, but they can be used to trade in or buy other reinforcers. Token systems um, have a lot of flexibility in that the price and the reinforcers can change with availability. So again, relating it to money in our economy, um, the prices of things can vary. The availability of certain products can vary and we can choose how we want to spend our money or our tokens in this case. Um, Tokens can also be delivered in a way that may not or be less likely to interrupt the flow of the interaction. Um, so I can put some little tally marks, I can put things on a board, I can ring up some numbers, I can, you know, click a little clicker or whatever it is, so that 
the um, interaction is still occurring um, in a much more natural way than say if my learner was getting um, to play with the car uh, after every time they demonstrated a certain skill. Uh, token systems allow us to delay those uh, reinforcers until a later time. So this isn't necessarily the best choice for an early learner who needs immediate reinforcement, but after they are able to tolerate a delay in reinforcement, after they've learned that skill, then we can use token systems to visually represent progress towards when we get to cash in and when that reinforcer is available again. Um, it also, using token systems, also reduces the likelihood that the learner is going to habituate to a specific reinforcer. So again, instead of getting to play with the car every after every performance of the skill, if we're earning tokens towards playing with the car um, after this interchange, it, it, interaction is complete, then my learner is less likely to habituate because they're not getting so much of that reinforcer over and over and over again that they get bored with it. Instead, they're kind of saving up, then they get to play with it, then they have to go for longer um, and save up again. In order to teach a token system, um, we can't just sit there and say, you're going to earn points for this, and then you can buy this other thing. If my learner has never experienced a token system by trading, um, then telling them the words is not going to control their behavior. It's not going to mean anything. So when you are teaching a token system, you have to experience the exchange of the token, one token immediately for whatever it is. So for example, if my kid wants to play with the car and I have been, you know, doing one skill and then here's the car, one skill, here's the car, one skill, here's the car. Now I want to introduce a token system. I can start with one skill, here's a token, give me the token, here's your car. One skill, here's your token, give me the token, here's your car. And the moment that my learner, when I give them the token, they hand it back to me, I know that they have now understood that this token buys the reinforcer. So now they've got the concept that token is not a meaningless thing. I don't need to throw a bit. I just exchange it and I get the thing that I actually want. So we have to set up that system first, and then we can increase Okay, you need two tokens before you can buy the car. Um, three tokens, and now that now it's your turn with the car. Um, so you can do that. And once they have been experienced token systems before and been successful with those, that's where then you could provide an explanation of a token system for a learner who has encountered those before. Now, one example of sometimes people jumping to just explaining the token system, but the learner hasn't really encountered it, is with small children when you are doing uh, toilet training. Oftentimes, um, people want to use sticker charts. Well, sticker charts, um, you can't jump straight to you get 10 stickers and then you get this big toy. If the learner is first learning to control um, their uh, elimination in a toilet, um, we need to, and you're trying to introduce a token system and they've never experienced a token system before, we have to go slower. So it might be that for every sticker, you get a piece of candy or with my kid it was a one kid it was brownie and one kid it was uh smarties so you get a little piece of like the, the little brownie or you get um a little piece of the candy um so one sticker equals that now two stickers equal that now three stickers equal a couple of those right because you also have to adjust the value right i'm not gonna work for three stickers for the same one little piece of candy, it's got to be a bigger piece or it's got to be a couple of pieces, right? 
Um, and then you can build up to, okay, 10 stickers, and then you get this bigger prize, right? So you have to experience it first, and then you can, then they learn the rules that then the rules, explaining the rules can um, control the behavior in the future. So to use a token system, identify what skills you're going to reinforce, Identify what items they can trade into. These should be using your preference assessment. Determine the cost of each reinforcer. Sometimes including the learner can be very helpful when setting the costs. Um, oh, I think this should cost me like 10 you know, tokens and this one's more like five. So if your learner can participate, have them participate and help set the cost. Now they might say, well, I think that should only cost two. Great. Well, then maybe it just takes a little bit longer to earn some of those tokens or the amount of it that they get is a little bit smaller. Right. Um, so that's where you adjust um, how frequently you're delivering the tokens. You also need to set up a trade in amount or a scheduled time. So either after they earn 10 tokens, they can trade in or after 10 minutes, 30 minutes then however many tokens they have is how many they can spend on here's, you know, the items they can choose. You want to deliver the tokens when the learner is engaging in those targeted skills. Um, you can explain to the learner if, if that uh, helps with their rule governed behavior, right? You can explain to them what, what earns tokens. So I will be delivering tokens for raising your hand and um, working on your worksheet right? And then you deliver the tokens for those skills. And then when the time or the determined amount of tokens is reached, then you allow the learner to trade in and cash in and get their reinforcer. Um, the goal is to teach a system that can then be used in various other settings, um, not to make the learner have to wait longer and longer and longer. That's sort of like a, a byproduct that you could use a token system to help teach delayed reinforcement, um, but you have to teach the system first. All right, so um, assignment, a little bit longer, a little bit more writing, but we covered a lot of different um, specific uh, teaching strategies. So define errorless and trial and error teaching, provide examples of when you would use errorless teaching and when you would use trial and error teaching, uh, define mass and interspersed trials as related to teaching, provide examples of using mass trials with one step instruction following, and then provide an example of using interspersed trials with one step instruction following. And then you can just write out kind of like it was at the top, um, clap hands, um, prompted this uh, and then touch shoe and then uh, what color is this and then clap hands right just write them out um, the list of like the SDs that you would use um, and in what order. Number six, provide the rationale for using a task analysis. Why would we break things down into small steps? Write a task analysis for tying your shoes. Um, things to think of. Uh, you want to um, practice it, <laughs> like sit down with your shoe and write down your steps. Um, you want to consider which hand and which method. There are actually quite a few ways to tie your shoes. One loop on this side, around, poke through, two loops tied in a knot. Um, you know, which which side are you holding the loop, which hand, um, it's probably going to need to be specified in this type of a task analysis because it matters because you might cross the laces and stuff. Um, once you write it up, practice it yourself and then give it to somebody else to practice and see if they can follow your task analysis just as it's written. Um, because we want to make sure that we are including enough detail for someone to follow that. Um, number eight, describe a rationale for using a token system. Why? Why would we use a token system? And then number nine, write a plan for teaching the use of a five-point token system. Not just giving me the rules, but how would you introduce 
a five point token system to a learner who has never used a token system before. Start with one, build up, what would that look like? So a lot of writing, a lot of different um, teaching strategies that we're using, but feel free to post your answers in the comments, subscribe, if you want to see more of these videos of our supervision curriculum series, and um, if you do post comments or ask questions or answers to the assignments, um, I am happy to give feedback in that way. Um, so feel free to do that and hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you.